What actually is sleep? What is happening in our body? It's massively complicated. Dr. Sophie has always been intrigued by what makes us feel good and function well. And she also has a PhD in health psychology. After working on the award-winning sleep improvement program, Sleepio, Sophie launched the Sleep Scientist to provide training in sleep and circadian science to media, business, elite athletes, and military. How important is sleep for our health? Lack of sleep seems to impact every area. We really view rest as lazy or sleep is lazy. How problematic is that? Sleep is not downtime. Sleep is about improving performance. The golden question really is how much is enough sleep? We can store up sleep debt. I just have no idea. Getting rid of my weekend lion would give me more energy. Caffeine. We have to talk about coffee. So when you consume caffeine, yep, you feel more alert, but you're not giving yourself more energy. You are just delaying fatigue. How bad is snoozing my alarm? <laughs> Um, Hi, I'm Dr. Frankie Jackson-Spence and welcome to Vision of Health, the podcast where I talk to qualified experts about what being healthy really looks like. Through our conversations, we'll bridge the gap between the scientific evidence base and you, the everyday person who just wants to live a healthier lifestyle. I am very much on a mission to provide evidence-based, educational content and practical tips that you can actually implement in your everyday lives. Our wonderful sponsors, Fenfresh, who have supported me for a number of years now, share the same vision to open up conversations on taboo subjects to bust the health myths and improve women's health. Femfresh are not only industry leaders in women's intimate hygiene products, but also committed on educating on all things women's health. And this podcast just wouldn't be possible without their support. You can also catch on socials at femfresh underscore UK and on their website, femfresh.co.uk. I'm Dr. Frankie, and this is my vision of health. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that I am a big advocate for a good night's sleep. And I really see sleep as one of the most fundamental but neglected pillars of our health. I am joined by Dr. Sophie Bostock, who is an award-winning sleep evangelist who is on a mission to improve people's lives by unlocking the science of sleep. Dr. Sophie has always been intrigued by what makes us feel good and function well. She studied medicine at Nottingham University. She then went on to do an MSc in entrepreneurship, and she also has a PhD in health psychology from University College London. She became fascinated in the power of sleep from shielding us from our daily stress, improving our health and our performance. After working on the award-winning sleep improvement program Sleepio, Sophie launched the Sleep Scientist to provide training in sleep and circadian science to media, business, elite athletes and military. Sophie really is the UK's leading sleep expert and I cannot wait to delve into this episode. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank Um, you. And I really appreciate how far you've travelled. We are really looking forward to chatting to you. So tell me about your journey. How did you become interested in sleep? It was a bit of an accident. Um, I was doing a PhD in a field called psychobiology. So all about how we think and feel interacts with our physiology, our physical health. Mm -hmm. And uh, my PhD was really all about trying to understand happiness and why optimistic, positive people seem to live longer. Mm -hmm. And as part of my research, I thought, right, what I really want to do is make people happier and sort of see what happens to their health. Uh, So I was casting around for an intervention that would make people happier. And I ended up working with at the time, a small company called Headspace, who had an app for mindfulness meditation. We recruited a couple of hundred volunteers and they learned to meditate using the Headspace app. And eight weeks later, a bunch of them came back and said, I don't know if I know how to meditate, but I'm definitely sleeping better. And I thought, oh, I hadn't even thought about sleep. And when I looked at the data, I realized that the people who were sleeping better, not only were they more positive, but they were less stressed at work. They felt more in control of their lives. And that just kind of flicked a switch. And I was like, oh, this sleep thing, this uh, is something that we are taking for granted. And that really intrigued me. And um, that was the start of a a sleep career. I love that. I love when doctors take a more unusual career rather than the traditional kind of conveyor belt of medicine. I would really love to ask you um, a really basic question, but actually I think it's a bit complex. What actually is sleep? What is happening in our body? It's massively complicated. I mean, sleep is not just one thing. And every night of sleep is different. And I think it's easy to take it for granted because we just close our eyes. We have no idea what's happening. Um, But actually, there's all sorts of different processes going on throughout the body. So classically, we talk about sleep in four different stages that we cycle through throughout the night. So the first stage, stage one sleep, very light phase of sleep. 
It's the kind of sleep that you get when you're kind of daydreaming. You know, it's it's hot, you're tired and you start to doze off. Uh, but if someone says your name, you'll probably wake up very quickly. And it doesn't seem to be very restorative. It's probably designed to help the brain decide whether it's safe to actually go down a little bit deeper into stage two sleep. And stage two is where really the brain starts to restore itself. We can see these electrical signatures, spindles and K complexes, which we think represent the storage of memory. So we take memories from our short-term memory storage in the hippocampus and we start to move them into the much larger cortex where we've got a lot more capacity. So that kind of kicks off in stage two sleep. Um, it's also really good for improving focus and alertness. So even if you only have a 20 minute nap, you get a bit of stage one and you get a bit of stage two sleep. And we know that that makes you feel a bit more alert and mm -hmm. upbeat for a couple of hours afterwards. And then after probably about 30 to 40 minutes, if you're lucky, you'll get into stage three or slow wave sleep. And people are very interested in slow wave, deep sleep, because this is particularly physically restorative. And this is when a lot of our growth hormone is produced and very recently, there was some research that showed in deep sleep, the gaps between the brain cells actually open up. And then this pulsing of electrical activity, which allows the brain to cleanse itself and actually kind of sucks out some nasty toxins called beta amyloid and tau, which have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And there's a really active area for research right now, looking at how deep sleep relates to our risk of cognitive decline. So it seems like we want to protect deep sleep for many reasons. Um, and then after a little chunk of, of deep sleep, we'll come back into a lighter stage of sleep, REM or rapid eye movement sleep, which is usually associated with dreaming. And we think that's really important for creativity and also for emotional balance. So one of the things that happens during dream sleep is that we start to separate out the emotional content of our memories from the factual content so that we can look back on the past without reliving perhaps uncomfortable emotions. Um, so every single stage of sleep, perhaps with the exception of stage one sleep, is hugely valuable. And we know we get more stage three deep sleep in the first part of the night and more REM sleep in the second part of the night. So interesting. And what happens if we don't get enough of one type of sleep? Because I know I read some research about kind of um, how certain sleeping tablets might work and they sometimes, correct me if I'm wrong, induce you to have more deep sleep but at the expense of lighter sleep. So then when you stop taking them, you then need to catch up on the light sleep. Is, is that true? There are all sorts of ways of, of sort of messing with what we call this natural sleep architecture. Yeah. And I think people often worry quite a lot because they may, may be tracking their sleep using mm. some kind of sleep tracker and they'll ask me, oh, why do I get more deep sleep, less REM sleep or vice versa? And the answer is the brain is really clever at working out what you need. So let's say you've had an incredibly physically active day. Maybe you, you ran a marathon or something. And the likelihood is you'll actually get more deep sleep that day, uh, at least if you weren't kind of overtraining and too stressed. Mm -hmm. But if you've had a much more emotional day, you might well end up with more REM sleep. So our sleep architecture changes quite a lot mm -hmm. depending on what we've been through. Another way to get more deep sleep is to deprive yourself of sleep. So if you don't sleep very well for a night, the following night, you'll actually sleep more deeply to help compensate. So I often suggest to people not to get too worried about what happens on one particular night. What we're interested in is kind of trends over, over time. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. I'm going to delve straight into the meaty question. Um, I mentioned at the start of the podcast that I really do see sleep as this neglected but really fundamental pillar as, of our health. And I see it as important as exercise and nutrition for our health. And often um, the ironic thing is that people get up really early to exercise or stay up late meal prepping and things. And it's often at the expense of sleep. I would love to hear from you as an expert, how important is sleep for our health? Because we know that if we get a bad night's sleep, we might feel a bit rotten the next day. But what are the actual health implications of not getting enough sleep? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> and I have to say, you are, you're one of the enlightened ones, Frankie. Um, I mean, you know, everybody now knows that 
sleep is important. You can barely open a newspaper or, or go on the internet without finding some new research report that lack of sleep has been linked to, you know, heart disease, diabetes, depression, um, weight gain, infection. Lack of sleep seems to impact on every area of our physical health, our cognitive performance and our emotional regulation. So we see that day to day as maybe just feeling a bit tired, maybe a bit irritable, perhaps hard to concentrate. But below the surface, it's almost like this, this iceberg. You can imagine there's the bit that we feel, but under the surface, we're seeing these increased risks of chronic disease, of inability to respond quickly or process information. And I think perhaps the best way to conceptualize why this happens is that if you think back to when our ancestors were living camped out in the savannah before we had uh, sleep deprivation from Netflix or a cost of living crisis. Or my emails. Oh, your emails, exactly, before social media. Um, there's the kind of things that kept people awake at night were dangerous. Mm. You know, it was predators, it was storms, it was hunger. And because of that, we have evolved or our brains have evolved to interpret sleep loss as indicating that we are in a dangerous environment. So what happens is that we, we dial up our fight or flight stress response. And as you will know, many of the, the viewers will know, all of our automatic processes are constantly in flux between either fight or flight or rest and digest. We're kind of sort of hinging between one and the other. And when you don't sleep enough, you have a tendency to always be in that kind of fight or flight, slightly hyper aroused state. So very often when people haven't slept very well, it's not that they're excessively sleepy, they're actually a bit wired. Mm. And I often meet people who, who kind of say, well, I'm, I don't really feel sleepy, but I'm definitely having difficulty sleeping. And it's because they're in this state of hyper arousal. And over time, that overexposure to the stress response starts to exhaust our internal system. So our immune function starts to be impaired. Perhaps we put more pressure on the cardiovascular system and our metabolism than we would otherwise. So it's just causing this state of chronic stress in the body, which is why it sort of impacts on every part of our sort of um, mental, physical and emotional functioning. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think, you know, when it comes to health, we all like a quick fix and we all like things that we can visibly see. And sleep is one of those ones that I even say it to my patients in clinic, you know, it's something that you don't necessarily see the benefits of over the long time. It's like compound interest, isn't it? Oh, but you do, you know, you, you see them in your skin, you see them in kind of wrinkles, um, but you also see them in behavior. So yeah. I think one of the consequences of sleep loss that people, this will probably feel familiar to people, even if they're not very conscious of, of it, is that our brain only has so much glucose, so much firepower. And when you're in this hyper aroused state of fight or flight, what tends to happen is that we actually send less glucose to our prefrontal cortex. Mm. So the executive control center of the brain, it's like putting our self control in a straight jacket. Hmm. So, you know, those goals that you wanted to stick to, whether it was going to the gym or sticking to a healthy diet, suddenly feel much harder yeah. and you actually become more impulsive, more likely to give in to cravings. So the impacts of sleep loss, they're not just on your mood and your physical health, but they're also on your behavior. So lack of sleep can compound other problems. Mm. It makes it harder to manage your health. Yeah. I read a study actually about how lack of sleep can interfere with your ability to recognize facial expressions and social cues. So when people are ratty or you're a bit snappy the next day, it can actually interfere with your relationships, whether like personal or professional. Um, I actually thought it was quite interesting that there's a bit of science behind that. Oh, 100%. But if you think about the reason why that happens, it, it goes back to the fact that our brains go into this state of fight or flight. Mm. So what happens when your brain thinks that you're under threat is that you perceive danger everywhere. So I might look 
to your face, to your facial cues. And when I'm short of sleep, I am more likely to interpret that you are angry or hostile. Whereas when you're well slept, you have a kind of much more neutral perception of your environment. And, and when you think about how that then impacts on your behavior, so let's say I come down to breakfast in the morning and I see a slightly blank face in front of me, I might interpret that as someone being hostile. So I'm then a little bit aggressive back. Mm -hmm. And you can quite easily see how couples are more likely to argue. And also some research showing, showing that they are more likely to be negative and accusatory in their problem solving approach. So um, we tend to become more critical when we're short of sleep. Yeah. So many reasons to go to bed early at night. <laughs> I think we really, I mean, you've touched on this question already, but I think we live in a society that really um, glorifies this hustle culture and this productivity. And we are really, you know, we really view rest as lazy or sleep as lazy. How problematic is that? I don't know whether it's the culture of, of hustle or just the fact that we we feel like we ought to be doing more. Because mm. I, I feel like the science around the value of sleep is kind of changing the perception that sleep is worthless. You know, I, when I speak to people, they know that sleep is important, mm. but they still feel like they have a lot to do. So there's always this kind of compromise of when am I gonna, um, when am I gonna stop so that I can allow sleep to happen? So I think we've got to change the, the priorities around recovery towards recognizing that sleep is not downtime. Sleep is about improving performance mm. and being the best version of you. And I think very often we think that sleep is our reward for working hard, whereas actually I think we will perform much better if we start with sleep. Yeah, that's an amazing way of framing it, actually. So when my mum was telling me to go to bed when I was revising till the early hours as a medical student, really, she was right. <laughs> my own sleep neglect definitely started as a medical student. And then I, uh, I read some research, unfortunately, after I left medical school, uh, which showed that they recruited 100 people and uh, they got them to learn a whole bunch of facts in four one-hour blocks. And halfway through the afternoon, they gave them one hour off and they split them into three groups. And one group got to kind of cram and reread as much as they could. One group got up to an hour to nap, and the other group just had a bit of a break. I think they watched videos on YouTube or something. And then they tested them at the end of the day to see how much they could remember. And they also tested them one week later. Mm, and they found that the groups that had either had a nap or crammed the information, scored significantly better than the group that had just had a break on the same day. But one week later when they tested them, it was only the group that had a nap that scored significantly better on their memory test. Just showing that even a short nap can help to consolidate memory. And uh, yeah, I definitely didn't know that as a medical student. I actually was quite good at napping as a medical student. I would definitely feel that afternoon um, slump and I would have literally a 10 minute nap and then get back to it. And everyone thought I was mental, but obviously, clearly I was ahead of the game. Absolutely. <laughs> What evidence dictates whether we've had a good night's sleep? Obviously, we all know that feeling when you're well rested and you wake up and you feel like a superhero that you can conquer the world. But is that actually representative of what's going on in our body? Is there actually any evidence for us to know we've had a good night's sleep? Yeah, I think how we feel is the most important metric, partly because your sleep need is different to my sleep need and it's partly genetic. It's partly going to depend on what you've done that day, but it's also going to depend what happened in the previous week or two? Mm. We can store up sleep debt. So you might have a, an amazing kind of eight hour sleep, but actually if you've been accumulating short nights of sleep for several weeks, you're still gonna be in a state of sleep deprivation. So we are all definitely very different and it depends not just on how you feel when you wake up, uh, but of course throughout the day. So. If you manage to get through the day without relying on caffeine or sugar to keep you going, um, if you can manage not to have lions at the weekend, which is a surefire sign that you're probably a bit sleep deprived during the week, uh, if you're able to concentrate, um, if you don't find yourself getting irritable and snappy for no kind of reason, um, and if you manage to wake up without an alarm clock, you're doing pretty well. All those are, are signs that you're, you're getting enough sleep. Yeah, interesting. And so the golden question really is how much is enough sleep? Because I find that some people 
you know, seem to have six hours a night and they feel fine. Whereas I really feel the effect if I have less than eight hours. In fact, nine upwards would be my perfect amount of sleep. And that that's obviously right for you. And, and it's just like any other biological characteristic, like your height or your shoe size. You know, there's a lot of genetic influence around how much sleep we actually need. Um, and it's very definitely a bell-shaped curve. So most people, according to the research, sleep experts have this consensus view that we need at least seven hours sleep on a regular basis to function at our best. But that means most people are kind of seven to nine hours, but there'll be a minority of people who really do thrive on six hours sleep and an even smaller proportion who might well be able to thrive on five hours, but they probably carry a short sleep gene and they are very unusual. Okay. But at the other side of the spectrum, there could well be people who need more than nine hours to function at their best. And uh, so you know, ask your parents, that's probably an important influence on your sleep, but also, you know, work with athletes. And if you're very physically active, the chances are that you're going to need more sleep for muscle repair and growth. Something you just touched on um, when you were answering that was about sleep consistency. So we've talked about kind of how many number of hours is important, but how important is consistency? Because I really like that analogy of sleep being like a bank and if you accumulate debt throughout the week can you really pay off at the weekend or is it better to get the same number of hours each night consistency is probably the number one thing that most people can do to improve their sleep quality without changing anything else so if you wake up at the same time every day seven days a week it anchors our circadian rhythms your internal body clocks um, so there are at least three systems which influence the timing and quality of your sleep. And the first is circadian rhythms. So these, uh, circa means about, day and day, these are rhythms which are programmed into every cell in our body. So every single cell system is programmed to operate on this 24-hour cycle. So when we wake up at the same time, it just means that everything is in sync. Your body is working beautifully efficient, beautifully efficiently. And it means that you start to be able to anticipate your wake up time. So for example, you'll get a good injection of cortisol, which helps to release glucose into the bloodstream and really makes you feel energized before your alarm goes off. And likewise, about an hour and a half before your usual bedtime, your brain will start to produce melatonin, which helps to prepare the body for sleep. But when your rhythm is very haphazard, the brain can't anticipate what's going to happen next. You're always playing catch up and perhaps your internal systems aren't speaking to each other as efficiently as they might, which can mess with your metabolism, make you feel tired. So I, I often find that people will, will come back to me having tried to change their sleep pattern and they'll go, I just have no idea that getting rid of my weekend lion would give me more energy. But because they're no longer wrenching their body clocks backwards and forwards, they're actually um, having more energy. That's so interesting. So you're saying that consistency and sleep quality actually trumps number of hours. It's a compromise. We need the time as well. So we don't want yeah. you to be sleep deprived. But uh, there's certainly a lot of research that suggests that just improving sleep consistency will improve your sleep quality. In particular, it will give you more of that deep, physically restorative sleep. Yeah. So those people that are worried about how much they've got to get done in the day, if they're feeling like they can't change their life today and say, I'm going to go to bed an hour earlier, one thing they can control is just that pattern. Absolutely. I think that's a really helpful tip, actually. Can you sleep too much? Yes, we can. There's a lot of debate actually about whether you really can sleep too much or whether people who sleep a lot have got some kind of underlying health condition that might be telling the body to sleep too much. So let me, let me clarify what I mean a little bit. If you are generally healthy and you wake up at the same time every day and you go to sleep when you're sleepy, it's highly unlikely that you're going to sleep too much. But what we do know is that some health conditions are linked to extra sleep, hypersomnia. So for example, depression. And one of the problems in depression, when people feel like really excessive low mood and they just, they don't want to get out of bed and they will sleep at any time of day or night, 
then that can disrupt these circadian rhythms and the brain becomes very confused about whether it's night or day. And so they might be sleeping a lot, but not getting very restorative sleep. Another condition that messes with sleep quality is sleep apnea, a respiratory disorder where during the night you actually pause your breathing. So it's often linked to very heavy snoring. So you get people who sort of snore. And then you get this pause. And then all of a sudden they go. And they kind of snort and gasp for breath. And, and that pause is an apnea where they've temporarily stopped breathing. And it's usually just because of compression of the tissues of probably the tongue that's fallen back. And it's not dangerous. But what happens is that they get woken up from the deeper stages of sleep. And they might not wake up so that they're alert. But multiple times through the night, they're having these momentary lapses in deep sleep. So they wake up after, say, nine, ten hours sleep and they're still exhausted. So I think some of the data where we look at large populations, what we tend to see is that people who get between seven and nine hours sleep have the best health outcomes. Whereas people who consistently sleep for more than nine or 10 hours, often at increased risks of things like heart disease. But one of the theories is perhaps some of those long sleepers are not getting good quality sleep, but we're still not exactly sure why too much sleep, particularly when we get older, is, is linked to worse health outcomes. Interesting. So too little sleep and potentially too much sleep, and um, there really is that sweet spot in the middle. So what about the people who have no choice? Because I know there's going to be some shift workers, like doctors listening to this or other shift workers, or there's going to be some new mums that's listening to this in the middle of the night while the baby's <laughs> crying or feeding. And this is going to be a really hard listen because they can't necessarily um, change their sleep pattern at the moment. What, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because I, I wanted to talk about this when I talk about consistency. Of course, like it would be great if we could all wake up at the same time, but very often that's not not within our, our gift, our choice. And the good news is that actually our circadian rhythms, at least during kind of working age, and particularly during childbearing age, seem to be fairly elastic. You know, we have evolved as human beings to have babies that require a lot of attention. You know, a newborn baby doesn't sleep for an awful lot more than two hours at a time. And yet, we have evolved to have multiple offspring and there's no difference in life expectancy between parents and non-parents. So some confidence, I think, for people who have children and are constantly getting up through the night. Similarly, though, for shift workers, what we do know is that long-term shift work, the more years that you've done night shifts in particular, the greater the risks of some chronic disease outcomes. But it's about managing risk. So typically we might find that shift workers are at say 25% increased risk of depression or heart disease, but they can mitigate that risk, reduce that risk by adopting other healthy behaviors. So, you know, if they stick to a really healthy diet and they regularly exercise, that's really going to help to manage that increased strain on the body from shifting their circadian rhythms all the time. So it's very much about treating shift work as one of the stressors on the body and managing that by reducing stress in other ways. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, going back to the new mum, it's obviously very reassuring that it's not going to affect their long term health. Um, But in that moment, so are naps restorative enough? Because we were talking earlier about that initial stage one sleep not being as important. Um, But that's obviously the main proportion of your nap. Well, hopefully, if you have a nap that's anything over 10 minutes, you're going to get a good chunk of sort of stage two sleep in there. So I think when uh, NASA did some studies looking at the perfect power nap, they suggested around about 20 minutes was ideal because it means that you get some stage one and stage two sleep, but you don't slip into stage three sleep. The only problem with waking someone up from stage three sleep is that they tend to feel very groggy and tired. You get something called sleep inertia. So it's not necessarily bad for you if you have a longer nap, but it might take you a long time to become fully alert again afterwards. So if you're in a situation where you can't 
perhaps because you are a shift worker or you're looking after young children, you can't get seven hours sleep overnight, then absolutely, I think napping is one strategy that you can use during the day to help improve alertness. But generally speaking, we wouldn't recommend that people try and replace nighttime sleep with naps. It's sort of an, an extra to keep you going because yeah. when you sleep in one consolidated bout, the advantage is that the brain is able to adjust that sleep architecture to what you really need at the time. That's so interesting. But if you're in a situation where you have no choice, a nap is certainly going to help. Because I sometimes think people don't bother if they think they don't have enough time, but you can have a little micro nap of 20 minutes and that's actually going to be helpful. 100%. And, and actually, there are some people that use this as a performance enhancing strategy. Yeah. You know, it actually really does improve cognitive function, improves alertness. For some people, it, it really improves their mood. Um, others say that they can't nap. Uh, there does perhaps seem to be some genetic influence over this. But I think even for the people who can't nap, if you feel like you're getting tired to the point where you can't keep your eyes open, giving yourself a little bit of time during the day to just pause. Maybe you lie down, maybe listen to some music, do some meditation. I still think that's a useful strategy for managing your levels of arousal, reducing stress and improving your mood. Yeah, that's really, really reassuring. Um, you mentioned before about our circadian rhythm when we were talking about consistency. And I'd love to talk about that because obviously our modern day life is not really built around our intrinsic circadian rhythm. You know, when I woke up to go to work this morning, it was pitch black outside. And likely when I get home tonight, as many listeners um, the same, it will be dark. How is that li like living outside of our circadian rhythm problematic. I think this is a really interesting area for research. I think for a long time we've just taken it for granted that so long as we can keep the lights on, we can keep going. And uh, now the research is sort of showing that in particular, artificial light at night seems to cause problems for the body. So there was one study that, that really fascinated me where they compared healthy people living with a dim light on, so a bit like leaving the TV on overnight, mm -hmm. with people who slept in complete darkness. And they actually showed that when you have a light on at night in your bedroom, or perhaps you've got a lot of light from street lights coming in through your window, it keeps the body in a higher state of arousal. People's heart rate stayed a little bit higher. And actually their insulin resistance was higher the next morning. So their ability to kind of process sugar. And there's a number of studies, particularly in older populations, that suggest that the more ambient light there is at night, the higher their risks of diabetes and weight gain. So it's definitely worth thinking about light exposure. So we want darkness before as we prepare for, bre for bed, but we also want as much light as possible, particularly first thing in the morning. And at this time of the year, that is a problem because we can't get it naturally necessarily. Um, so I did bring a prop with me. Can I grab my prop? Absolutely. Okay, so I, <laughs> I brought with me, um, an example of an artificial tool that you can help to sync your body clocks in the winter. Uh, so this is a sad lamp, which is designed for seasonal affective disorder. So there are certain people that tend to feel particularly low mood during the winter months when the nights draw in, we have less natural daylight. Now, I think a lot of people experience a version of this, mm -hmm. which is colloquially called the winter blues. Um, but actually there are some people, a minority of people who experience clinical levels of depression every winter. And then it seems to disappear in kind of March time when the clocks change again. So if you're in that space where actually you really struggle to get going in the morning, particularly in the winter, you can use one of these. Uh, and all that you do is you sit with it, perhaps as you're having your breakfast in the morning uh, for about half an hour and you sit about a foot away. Um, and for those people who are listening to this and can't see, it's just a bright light. Um, and it's actually designed to emit 10,000 lux lux being a measure of light intensity. And it's equivalent to what you might get if you walked outside on a sunny day. And we think that by sitting with this for half an hour every morning, it helps to sync your body clocks. And within a week, people start to experience improvements in their mood and energy. So it might be worth a try if you're yeah. 
I actually use one of them. I think there's like limited evidence as to whether they are actually effective. I always think they can't harm. And they actually make a really good makeup light. <laughs> Um, but yeah, any, every little helps, right? Yeah. I, I definitely notice I have much less energy in the winter. In the summer, if someone asks you if you want to do something and it's 7 p.m., you think, yeah, they've got the whole night ahead of me. I'm up for it. Whereas in the winter, I'm like, it's bedtime. <laughs> um, so definitely uh, experience that change. And so that takes me on quite nicely to my next question, which is what are some of our lifestyle habits that may be um, negatively affecting our sleep? I think probably one of them that people might not think about so much are uh, eating times. So particularly eating late at night. Mm. So we've talked a lot about circadian rhythms and light is the most important zeitgeber or time giver that helps us set our clocks. But movement and food are also really important cues for the body. So if you get up in the morning and you move your body somehow, just being physically active, even if it's just 10 minutes uh, walking around the block, that's a really good cue to get your body going. Your brain knows, yep, it's time to be alert. And another one is eating breakfast. Um, so we know that if you are a natural night owl, so you've got a more delayed body clock, you can help to bring it forward by bright light in the morning, going for a walk or doing some exercise first thing, and also eating breakfast within the first hour of waking up. All of those are cues that are going to make you more alert. But conversely, before bed, it's really important not to eat too late at night because that actually is a cue to the body that it's time to stay up and be yeah. alert. And the other reason is that your circadian rhythms in metabolism sort of slow down late at night mm. and you're more likely to store excess calories as fat. You know, it's, it's harder for the body to actually metabolize efficiently when we eat late at night. I really thought you were going to say this <laughs> and how we're all scrolling on Instagram and TikTok or doing our emails right before bed. I read something about the blue light from your phone being equivalent to a cup of coffee on your melatonin levels or something. I, I haven't seen that in the research. What's interesting actually about um, phones, it's not so much the light. Actually, when you look at the amount of light which is emitted from a phone, mm. it's very low intensity. You know, that sad lamp is 10,000 lux. Mm. From your phone, you probably only get about 80 lux. But what is, I think, personally more important is actually the impact of consuming loads of sort of cognitively arousing stimulation from your phone. Our natural state for our brains is a sort of, a sort of daydream. And when we pay attention, when we concentrate on anything, it takes energy. Mm. And when you try and pay attention late at night when your brain is actually trying to switch off, the only way that you can keep concentrating is probably to fire up a little bit of the stress response, release a little bit of cortisol, kind of get your body going so that you can keep concentrating. And I think that is what is a more important factor that influences sleep because if you're stressed it reduces the amount of deep sleep that you're going to get yeah um so using your phone too much before bed in a more kind of alerting way can be a problem but i do also know a lot of people use their phones to listen to relaxing music or meditation and actually i i think technology can also have a positive influence on our sleep it's just about how we use it yeah that's really great to know actually and also good to bust a myth that i clearly believed <laughs> Um, and what are some of the things that we do in our day that may actually be helpful for our sleep? You know, sometimes we have health behaviors and I always say to people, you know, you going to the gym regularly or doing a sport is, you know, helping from an exercise perspective, but it's also going to help your gut health and your mental health and, and your sleep. <laughs> yeah, this is what I want to get at. So what are some of the health behaviors people might be doing that are going to double up as benefiting their sleep? Well, I think exercise is, is the winner. You know, it's good for everything. It improves your mood, improves your energy, and it also definitely improves your sleep. So some studies suggest that just 30 minutes of exercise on one single day is going to improve the depth of your sleep that night. Um, so regular exercise definitely is a, a big tick for sleep health. The other great thing about exercise is that there was a recent study that suggested that people who were actually having too little sleep they seem to be protected against some of the health harms through regular exercise. So there's definitely maybe a kind of compensatory mechanism that goes on there. Um, I think good health sort of complements uh, good sleep. 
And so we know that having a healthy diet tends to be linked to better sleep patterns. Um, I think managing stress, whatever that means for you. So, you know, taking breaks during the day, perhaps practicing meditation, uh, perhaps doing some breath work, simply spending time outdoors in nature seems to have a positive impact on sleep. And I think another big one that's often forgotten in the context of sleep is about your social relationships. Mm. You know, we know a lot of people during COVID in particular reported terrible sleep problems. Now there's multiple reasons for that. Certainly we had some disrupted circadian rhythms. People weren't able to go outside as much. Um, people perhaps using more screens as they were kind of checking for news and definitely worrying. So that was activating their stress response, but also that feeling of isolation. There was some evidence that people who are lonely tend to sleep worse. So strong social connections can also protect your sleep. That's that's really helpful. I think um, you mentioned one about managing stress. One thing that's really helped me sleep better at night is my mind is always racing. I've always got a million things that I need to do. It's kind of dumping it on some paper before I go to sleep and I'm like I can pick that up in the morning and not forget anything and I literally just write down everything that's on my mind and then I'm like okay now I can sleep. That is brilliant advice really. Um, I think journaling has a lot of benefits uh, and and I'd often read about this and I didn't really believe it. I'd tried it now and again. We don't like the woo. No absolutely it sounds too good to be true. So I tried it for a few days at a time. Didn't seem to make any difference. I didn't stick with it and then um, last summer I went on a long expedition. I canoed from Canada to Alaska. Um, I took nine weeks off to go and do it and uh, I thought it'd be very interesting because I'd be away from electric light for the entire period totally kind of on our own in the wilderness. And there was me thinking this would be really good for my sleep. But actually it turned out that moving from A to B and being out in the wilderness where there might be bears or storms in my tiny little tent um, actually stressed me out quite a lot. And to begin with, I did not sleep well at all. And uh, there was a lot of time spent in my tent. And one of the few things that I had to do was... uh, you know, have a notebook. And I started writing a diary. And to begin with, I just wrote about what we'd done that day. But after a couple of weeks, I realized that I started to write about other things, about feelings and thoughts that had probably been whizzing around in my head that I'd never really had time to articulate. Mm. And night after night, I just kind of write whatever was in my head. And I found it massively therapeutic. And I realized that this sort of writing practice is a bit like going to therapy. I think one of the reasons that therapy can be so helpful is it kind of brings to the fore things are, that are in the back of your mind that are maybe whizzing around keeping you awake at night. So any way of expressing thoughts and feelings that might otherwise be a bit trapped, whether it's on paper or to someone else, I think is another way of sort of reducing the stress response and creating space in the mind for sleep. Yeah, really helpful. This um, something I must talk about and I almost forgot I was approaching um, near the end of the episode caffeine. We have to talk about coffee. Um, I personally love a little bit of a bougie coffee in the morning, but is coffee okay to drink for our sleep? You know, how much can we drink and get away with? Um, Should we be switching to decaf? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay. So we have spent quite a lot of time talking about circadian rhythms. I said there are three systems which influence the quality of your sleep. Circadian rhythms, the second is sleep pressure, and the third is the stress system. So we've also talked a bit about that. Sleep pressure is the buildup of a chemical called adenosine that makes you feel sleepy. So the more hours you've been awake, the more you break down this substance called ATP to reduce to produce energy, and it, it releases this side product called adenosine. Adenosine makes you feel sleepy. The more hours you've been awake, the more adenosine accumulates, the sleepier you feel, unless you block the effects of adenosine. And caffeine works by blocking the effects of adenosine. It actually kind of muscles in on the adenosine receptors in the brain and prevents the adenosine from doing its job. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't get rid of the adenosine. It just blocks the signal for a while. So when you consume caffeine, yep, you feel more alert, but you're not giving yourself more energy. You are just delaying fatigue. Mm 
because when that caffeine breaks down, all that adenosine is still there. And so one of two things may happen. You may, after the caffeine is broken down, just get hit by this wave of adenosine and feel incredibly tired, at which point most people then have another cup of coffee. And then if you have too much coffee, it can interfere with sleep at night. But I think one of the biggest things around caffeine is that the more you drink, the more of a tolerance you build up. So the brain actually starts to produce more adenosine receptors. So you have to keep consuming more to have the same alerting effect. And then if you have caffeine every day, the brain actually kind of develops a taste for it almost. You develop a dependence and probably about 15 or 20 minutes before your normal cup of coffee, you start to feel really tired. So what I tend to find when people cut down on their caffeine is they actually say they have more energy because they're no longer dependent on this external substance for a sort of a shot of energy. Now, I I don't have a problem with people drinking caffeine, but I just recommend that people are strategic about it. Try not to drink caffeinated drinks every day because then actually you're more sensitive to caffeine. And when you really need the energy, it's going to be a lot more effective. It's a more useful tool. Yeah, exactly. And I, that's exactly how I see it as a strategic tool for managing your energy. So if you are really sleepy, probably a better strategy is to pop outside, get exposure to some bright natural light, mm. move your body a little bit. That's going to have an alerting effect. Uh, make sure you drink some water, that you're not dehydrated. Those things can kind of sap your energy as well. Um But if you are going to cut down on caffeine, I do recommend to people that they taper it down because you can get quite nasty sort of headaches and withdrawal effects, which can very quickly be relieved by consuming more caffeine. And caffeine can linger in your in your blood a long time. So we shouldn't be drinking it in the afternoon if we are going to drink it at all. Is that correct? Yeah, there'll be a lot of people listening to this who go, but it doesn't really affect me. Yeah. Some people have after dinner espressos, yeah. the Italians. <laughs> yeah. And there's definitely some uh, genetic variation in how quickly we metabolize caffeine. So there, some people will be more sensitive to it than others. But I also think it could well be affecting your sleep architecture and mm. you don't really realize. A bit like alcohol, right? You can still fall asleep, yep. but the quality of the sleep is not going to be the same. Exactly. And, and so this is one of these scenarios where I'm like, well, if you're not sure, experiment. Mm. Just cut down on your caffeine for two weeks and see whether it makes a difference. And very often when I suggest that to people, they'll come back and say, wow, you know, it it had way more impact on me than I thought. Mm. So there was a recent review that suggested that even caffeine consumed eight hours before bed can still have a disruptive effect on sleep quality. So reduce that amount of deep sleep. So maybe use kind of eight or nine hours as your cutoff Mm -hmm. um, before bed. Okay, helpful. And um, one question I haven't asked that is something I really want to know personally. How bad is snoozing my alarm? (laughs) Um, So there was a a lovely study that was published quite recently where they compared people who snoozed and people who didn't. And they look particularly at sleep inertia, that grogginess, like how quickly you feel alert. Yeah, because I feel sometimes I wake up, I'm kind of awake, but I'm like, I don't need to get up yet. I'll snooze for 10 minutes. And then I wake up on the second alarm and I feel like I've just come out of a coma. Right. Well, that that (laughs) kind of ties into the results of the the research. Um, And I was listening to Radio 1 the other day and people were talking about some people set their alarm sort of an hour or two hours before they normally wake up just so they can snooze it and feel the satisfaction of staying in bed. Unfortunately, Fortunately, in terms of the impact on your alertness, the more times you press the snooze button, the worse your sleep inertia tends to become. And what you're doing is giving yourself a lot more light sleep. Mm. You're depriving yourself of the opportunity of getting REM sleep or deep sleep, which are actually probably going to have a more valuable effect. So my advice is always set the alarm for the time that you really need to get up. Ideally, put it out of reach so that you actually physically have to get up and out of bed in order to turn the alarm off and put it right next to some kind of light, either the light switch or the the blinds, so that the first thing that you do is move your body and get some light. And that should help you to feel more alert. And that leads me on perfectly to my penultimate question, which is what are some takeaway tips that people who want to improve their sleep can implement today? Okay, so we 
talked about consistency. And for those people who aren't shift workers and are in control of their rhythm, I would suggest that that's where they start with waking up at the same time every day of the week. Uh, and if the thought of going without your lion makes you cry, um, I will give you an hour. So our circadian rhythms can probably adjust by about an hour every mm -hmm. 24 hours. So an hour's extra sleep at the weekend, okay, but ideally aiming to get up at the same time every day. Uh, a second one would be getting outdoors more more natural light, like even if it's only for 10 minutes at a time. And if you really can't get outside, at least try and work next to a window. There was one study that compared office workers who sat by a window versus those who had no natural light. And it found that the ones that actually worked right by a window got an average of 46 minutes more sleep. And I think that is partly due to this kind of influence on our, our circadian rhythms. Uh, another thing that we haven't talked about is winding down before bed. And uh, everybody I think is aware of the advice for parents that for young children, having a familiar routine is really good for their sleep, but exactly the same thing is true for adults as well. And the part of the benefit is just the predictability of your brain knowing what's coming. So our stress system is very sensitive to uncertainty. So if you can create a sense of control and familiarity, those things are very reassuring for the brain. So doing the same things in the same order, um, winding down gently before bed. Uh, some people find reading very helpful. If you dislike reading, don't read. Um, <laughs> listen to music or have a bath. Um, having, actually, having a bath is an interesting one. Um, so in order to get into deep sleep, our body needs to cool. You have this circadian rhythm in body temperature. But when we get into a warm bath, what happens is that our blood flow goes to the extremities to try and cool us down. So the overall impact of the body is actually to cool core body temperature. And when you get out of the bath, you cool a little bit more. So actually having a warm bath, which is one of the things my mum always used to recommend before bed, turns out she was right. And it's very good for your sleep quality. I'm a huge advocate of a pre-bed routine. I'm really diligent with it. Sometimes I leave plans early to go home to have my bath and put my candle on and have a little pre-bed routine. Um, and I just think it like makes my brain associate with now as time sleep's coming. Well, you get full marks. And actually, <laughs> your mention of a candle is a good one as well. Um, just simply because when you light a candle, I think we have this natural tendency to then turn the lights down exactly. so that we can enjoy the candle. And actually, that is a really good routine to get into of like reducing the bright light. They're super helpful tips. And I say this whenever we talk about making health changes, people don't have to do all of these. Implementing just one or even just like getting 15 minutes more sleep per night by setting that alarm when they actually need to get up rather than giving themselves time to snooze is is going to be helpful and something we can implement today. 100%. I think people often, if they're not getting seven hours sleep, they can be quite critical of themselves and kind of give up. But exactly as you say, just 10 minutes more sleep a night, that's more than an hour a week extra. That's hugely valuable. Honestly, this conversation has been so insightful. I feel like I'm pretty clued up on sleep and I've still learned so much. I could the hour has flown by and I could carry on talking to you all evening. Um, I have a little tradition on my podcast where I'm asking all of my guests to share with me, what is your vision of health? What does health look like to you? My vision of health? Um, I'm going to talk about an aspirational vision, which is uh, an equitable one where everybody has the knowledge and the environment that they need to be able to look after their health. And I think that's why that podcasts, free platforms like this are so valuable because they're accessible to everyone. So thank you for what you do and, and making that kind of vision a reality. Oh, thank you so much for your time today. And um, I hope that everyone has really enjoyed the episode and learned so much from you. Um, great to great to chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Vision of Health. I hope you take away some realistic and practical health advice that you can actually incorporate in your busy lives to become the healthiest version of yourself. If you want to hear more from me, then please do hit the subscribe button, share this post, and also go follow me on Instagram at DrFrankieJS, where I post a regular series of Women's Health Wednesdays with our wonderful sponsors, FemFresh. I'll see you next time.